So this evening, the IMF is proud to have Dr. Joseph McHale, our Chief Medical Officer, presenting. He's also Professor, Translational Genomics Research Institute at City of Hope Cancer Center and Director of Myeloma Research and Consultant Hematologist, Honor Health Research Institute, and most importantly, our Director of Myeloma Research. Dr. McHale has a tremendous passion for education and travels around the world, lecturing and developing collaborations in the myeloma community. Having been a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic and a world-renowned expert in myeloma, Dr. McHale brings a wealth of his experience to help us better understand key updates and information. He has conducted dozens of clinical trials in the field of myeloma and has contributed to the development of many novel drugs. So thank you for all of that, Dr. McHale, and it's now my pleasure to turn this call over to you. Oh, thanks, Robin. I should bring you around to all my talks so you can give me that kind of introduction. Wow. <laughs> I usually just say uh, my name is Joe and I'm here to give the talk. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. I know everyone's inordinately busy and probably uh, dealing with the diabetes of Halloween the day after, but we're grateful that you're uh, with us. And, and I really hope this is going to be helpful to all of us tonight. Um, I'll probably spend about the next 40 minutes or so, uh, 35 to 40 minutes, talking to you about clinical trials in myeloma, um, and then we'll take time for, for your questions. And the idea here is really, as, as Robin has said, to give you uh, a clear picture of what trials are about. For some of you, you're experts, you've even been on trials. For some of you, it's a scary term and phrase, and so I hope to demystify some of that. And I hope by, by the end of the, of the discussion that I'll bring to you, uh, that we'll be excited, frankly, about what's happening in multiple myeloma and a lot of the uh, great things that are to come. So if you go to slide two, entitled Improving Survival in Myeloma, I start most of my myeloma, myeloma talks with this slide because I think of it as the happy and the unhappy slide. The happy part is the lower part of the slide. In the blue lines, you see that those lines are getting higher and higher, which means that myeloma patients are living longer all the time now as we have developed these great drugs. The sad part of the slide is there's a gap between the blue lines and the black or gray lines, which is an, what we call age-matched control, meaning the same people of the same age who do not have myeloma. So in general, the population is also living longer, but there's still a big gap. And the real purpose and objective of clinical trials is to close that gap, to allow our patients to not only live longer, but to live better. Uh, indeed, that's the nature of these series called Living Well. And so hopefully we'll talk a little bit about tonight how we can continue to close that gap. Slide three really tries to look back at the last 10 years. I mean, I like to say that very few cancers in the world have we seen a doubling, if not even a tripling of, of overall survival. And we've seen that over the last 10 to 12 years in multiple myeloma. We've seen it because of all these 10 new drugs that have been approved. I'm not going to read them all out to you. You can see them there. But one of the important things is you see that there are five lines there showing five different classes of drugs, and we're going to see even more of those classes tonight. And now many of them can be used in different contexts, not just up front, but maybe at relapsed myeloma or in combination and maintenance. There's lots of different ways of using these drugs. But now, of course, we are starting to include even more drugs. We've come to appreciate that what we have right now in myeloma, although it's made a big difference, is not likely the nature of curing myeloma. And so we need more. And part of that is understanding the disease better. And that's one of the great things we do at the IMF. And I have a privilege of doing both at TGen and City of Hope is trying to understand this disease better and understanding what we call the biology of the disease so that we can appreciate it better. And if you move on to the, what looks like scary slide number four, I promise this is not going to be a basic science lecture and bring you memories of sixth grade science class. But I like to show this slide, uh, and if you click through to make sure you see all of the different features of it, it's a reminder that myeloma is not just about the myeloma cell. What makes myeloma one of the most unique diseases in the world, it's not just that there's a cancer that's growing. It's the fact that that cancer has this unique and uncanny, uncanny and frankly, unfortunate ability to marshal the resources around it. 
sometimes I, I say, think, even though I'm a Canadian pacifist, as many of you know, um, think of it as an enemy that's entered the building across the street from you. You know, we, we, we find that the enemy is not just a problem. Now the enemy takes control of that whole building, and it has control of the water and of the power and of the Wi-Fi. I joke and say, if you want to make my two daughters completely useless, turn off the Wi-Fi. But without Wi-Fi, they can't do anything. So as we try to attack the enemy in the building across the street, some strategies may include blowing up the building, like a stem cell transplant, Uh, We might be able to use what we sometimes call targeted therapy, where we say, well, let's just hit that part of the building where the enemy is. But this picture helps us see that with all of these complicated communication networks between the myeloma and its environment, sometimes we don't even touch the myeloma or touch the enemy. As I say, we turn off the Wi-Fi, or we shut off the power, or we shut off the water, and that doesn't allow the myeloma cell to communicate. The other unique feature to myeloma is if you look and see those other pictures around the two purple myeloma cells, you see things called stromal cells or T cells or natural killer cells. These are really important parts of our own immune system. And one of the things we'll discover today is that we are learning to leverage our own immune system against the enemy. So it's literally like taking the building and using features of the building against the enemy itself. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do in clinical trials. And one of the reasons why the basic science study of myeloma is so important to lead up to a trial. All right, let's move to slide five called objectives. And I'll just quickly uh, outline what I want to cover with you in this next half hour. So we're going to review some of the immense progress made due to clinical trials. And we've talked a little bit about that already. I'll give you the basics of clinical trials. What's a phase one trial? What's a phase two trial? I can't give you every last detail, but I'll try and give you the thumbnail sketch of each. We'll look at the benefits and some of the challenges. Not everything is perfect with a clinical trial. We have challenges all the time, but yet we have tremendous benefits. Then we'll think a little bit about what are key trials going on in myeloma right now. What drugs should we be watching out for? And then maybe preview some of the ones that are coming that we hope are going to be accessible to our patients in the near future. So slide six kind of outlines where we've come from the old days of just using melphalan to when we introduced steroids and where we introduced uh, transplant in the conventional area. And now in this novel therapy, you start to see that not only are there more drugs added, there are more colors added as we have more and more uh, uh, types of treatments and mechanisms of action. And then if we extend that even further in slide number seven, we'll see that there are even more drugs that are there and ones that I haven't even listed here that we could talk about, but interesting drugs like esotuximab and CAR T-cell therapy and Selinexor and these kinds of drugs that we're going to be discussing uh, over the next half hour. So if we go on to slide eight, we have to think to ourselves, when we do research, it's not just about discovering the next drug. It really is asking critical questions like, how can treatments be matched to a patient's subtype or genomics? We've come to realize in this era of so-called precision or personalized medicine that it's not just the myeloma that's in someone's body. It's actually how that person's own genetics deals with that. So at times we talk about the genes of the cancer cells, but we're coming to appreciate that it's The host is also important, and as we try and match those two together, we can find unique ways to really give the best treatment to the best patient. So so often in my clinic, I have two patients who, if you will, on paper look the same in terms of their myeloma, but their disease behaves very differently to treatment. Why is that? And part of that is obviously the differences in myeloma being so complicated, but also from the patient themselves. What are the best drugs or combinations of drugs? And we spend a lot of time doing clinical trials to answer that question. Is it better to use drug A and B, or is it better to use A and C? Or is it better to use A, B, C together? Are those the kinds of questions we look at? And then lastly, in light of what I've just shared with you, what new molecules could be effective? So we do have great drugs already, and we're very grateful for them, and they have made a massive difference in our patients' lives. But as I mentioned, we still have to discover more. If you go to slide nine, we have to sometimes think about what tends to scare people off about trials, even before we get into the details of trials. 
sometimes people say, well, what if I just get the sugar pill instead of real therapy, the, the placebo pill? Well, in myeloma and in cancer in general, we don't give placebos alone when people need treatment. So it's not like someone feels like they're, they're just spinning a wheel and hoping to get a drug. There may be a placebo involved, but it's usually in addition to the standard of care versus a new drug plus the standard of care. And I'll show you examples of that in a moment. Or secondly, that I'm going to be treated like a guinea pig. And that's one important take-home message today is that you are not just a subject contributing to the world of myeloma knowledge. You're a person. For those of you who have been my patients or who know me, know that I love my patients and we care for them as people, not as a number or a disease. And no one should ever feel that way. And very often people do have their expectations exceeded. Not always. Some people, of course, have challenges with trials. But you're not just a test subject. You're a real person that we want to help. And then lastly, some people think, oh, I guess the clinical trial or is really kind of the Hail Mary pass, as it were, like when everything else has failed, maybe we'll do a trial. And that's not true either, because we um, very often can use trials early on in newly diagnosed myeloma. We can do it at times for supportive care to look at people's quality of life. And so we want to make sure that we're not um, uh, think, having people think, oh, my goodness, my doctor is considering me for a clinical trial. I must be at the very end, or I'm only going to consider a trial at the very end. If you go to slide 10, how is it that a new drug is developed? And this is a very simplistic view, but the first thing we do is we have to identify that target. That's why I showed you that really complicated slide. I, mean, I have friends of mine that spend their whole lives looking at one little arrow on that slide that we had is, is this a natural target? If we actually knock out that area or if we affect this, this communication pathway, will we be able to affect myeloma? And that's often done in the lab, either with um, uh, uh, what we call myeloma cell lines, so we can grow myeloma cells in, in the lab so they're not inside a, a person or an animal, uh, and we identify that target. But then we start to say, okay, well, if I have a drug that, that works at that target, let me see, does it work in the lab? So maybe I know that this, this is an important pathway, but what happens if I stop that pathway? Maybe the disease will just find a way around it, and it doesn't really matter. You know, you close one street, everybody else just can drive around it and go a different way, and it doesn't affect the movement of traffic. And we're trying to stop, as it were, traffic here. We're trying to stop the myeloma from growing and getting to where it wants to go. So we have to confirm that in the lab and, and very often in animal studies, as I'll explain in a moment. And then thirdly, we bring it to uh, patients where we need to make sure, most importantly, number one, that it's safe. That's absolutely critical. Safety is paramount. Just because something may work in a mouse, I mean, I'm going to tell you in a minute that we're a lot more like mice than you think, unfortunately. But thankfully, we are not mice, and so we need to be uh, demonstrate its safety, but then we secondly demonstrate what we call its effectiveness or how well it works. And, of course, this takes years and millions of dollars, and one of the reasons why research is a process over time. Slide 11 talks to us about the importance of clinical trials. I mean, remember, if it weren't for this kind of research, we wouldn't be where we are today. I want to reiterate that no one is meant to be a guinea pig without a potential benefit of entering a clinical trial. And we have very tight standards here in the United States, in Canada, around the world, uh, where people may be calling in today because uh, this is very fundamental that we conduct research uh, in a way that is ethical and under very close review. And perhaps one most important lesson, I sometimes joke when I'm giving a lecture, if you want to sleep through my whole talk, remember a few key points. This is one of them. The communication open and honest with your physician and your healthcare team who are talking to you about a clinical trial is important. No one should ever feel that they're being rushed into something. It should be discussed very openly and clearly. Well, why would anyone want to go on a clinical trial? Slide 12 helps us with this. You know, everyone, as I've mentioned, is unique and has to be viewed that way. But very often, clinical trials are helpful because they give us access to a new drug that may take a few more years before it's FDA approved. And that way, we can delay the standard therapy so it gives us another option. As we know in myeloma, very often is about sequencing drugs one after the other. And if I can wait to use the next drug because I'm on a clinical trial for a while, that may be able to push my remission for longer and keep my relapses further away. 
Of course, there's a contribution to the myeloma world, uh, which can be helpful and, and altruistic in some ways, but we want immediate, of course, benefits to the patient. And often financially, it can access drugs that may ultimately or, or, or at certain times be very difficult to access. And this, of course, has to be balanced with risks. You know, no drug comes without a risk. Every single thing we take in life, everything uh, that we get exposed to in life has a potential risk. And then there's, of course, the possibility that it won't work. Well, what do we do before a phase one trial in slide 13? Most agents, of course, we have to test in the lab. And as I mentioned, we call it in vitro, which means it's, it's in a test tube, as it were, not in a patient. And we have various cell lines across the world that we share amongst researchers and can use to test different concepts. And then we take it a little bit more to an animal model, as I mentioned. And believe it or not, genetically, we're not that different than mice. Thank God, as I said, we aren't mice. But there are, we often will do mouse, mouse studies, and that uh, allows us to test a concept very quickly because the obviously life of a mouse is shorter and we have the ability to test it in an unusual way. And then the very first, if you will, clinical trial, if we're using that word today, is what is sometimes called a phase one first in human. Sometimes they used to be called first in man, but first in human. I've had the privilege of leading a couple of these over my career where we're really going from the lab then to the mouse and now to the patient, and, and we introduce it for the very first time. And very often we have to start with a very low dose. So the next slide, 14, is just to show you that in vitro we can work with cell lines. And slide 15, uh, hopefully some couple of cute mice there to, to not scare you off entirely from them, but that is sometimes called murine or mouse activity before we bring it to humans. So slide 16 gives you the very simple overview of what's a phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trial. Phase one, it's really about testing the safety of a drug. You're bring, we're bringing into a patient the first time, a lot of these drugs now are showing tremendous benefit, even in phase one, which is great. But really, the concept is we want to make sure this drug is safe. Phase two is designed, now that we know the safe dose, let's give it to patients to see how effective it is. And then phase three is, can we make what is so-called the standard of care? If I'm already using drug A in a patient, we know that drug A works well in myeloma and it's safe and it's the standard of care. Can I make A better by giving the test drug with it, uh, let's say the test drug is B. So I might, in a phase three trial, want to compare A alone, which is what we're currently using, with A plus B to see if B contributes to making that combination better. And we'll explain a bit more of that as we go. So another way to picture this is slide 17, where we see in smaller numbers of patients, we test safety in phase one. We see how well it works in phase two. And now in phase three, which tend to be much larger trials, we compare it to the standard of care. So then drilling down a little bit with each of these, slide 18 talks about phase one clinical trials. Everyone gets the drug, and we're trying to find the optimal dose of that drug or of the combination that we're giving. And as we move along, we tend to start at lower doses, and then we go up. All right, this person, these three patients were, were, were treated safely at half a milligram. Well, now let's go up to one milligram, or then to two or to three, depending on the drug. And we can learn about side effects. Are there side effects? And how we do often a lot of blood tests, for those of you who've been on phase one trials, to make sure what's the, the amount of the drug still in someone's system at three hours after they take it, or six hours, or nine hours after they take it. And these are important in all phases and stages of myeloma so that we can understand how the drug works. The next slide, phase two, tells us a little bit more about how we're trying to understand how effective the drug is. And uh, we sometimes follow on a phase one right, uh, sorry, phase two right after a phase one. So sometimes you'll see phase one slash two trial where we're now um, adding, uh, building on that dose that we've arrived at as being the safe dose to see how well it works. And in almost all phase two trials, every patient gets the experimental therapy. There can be some variation in that. Uh, but in some cases, there can be two arms, as it were, two as we've described before, where someone will get a combination uh, with the new agent and another may not. And then lastly, in slide 20, we have the phase three clinical trial, which is really sort of the ultimate trial. This is the one that almost always the FDA will at least not, at least if not need it for approval, will ask the company to do it uh, 
soon after approval so that they can see that it's been validated. Uh, so this is the highest form of evidence. And patients will, you, will receive either the experimental therapy, which is the new combination, or the current standard of care. So this is uh, very important that at minimum, everybody on the trial gets the standard of care. And I think that's a particularly important feature for people to uh, understand. Um, very often in a so-called randomized process, which means we don't know what arm the patient's going to go on, and often it's called double-blinded, which means the patient doesn't know, nor does the treating team know. So when I put patients on phase three clinical trials, I don't know which treatment they're on, because if it's a pill, they may have the new pill plus the standard of care, or a sugar pill versus the standard of care, as it were, a placebo. And that becomes important so we don't bias people's view of how things are going on the trial. And this is very closely monitored. We need to know every side effect that patients are experiencing because this becomes critical in the approval of the, of the drug. Slide 21 starts to bring it home to us. Well, when would I consider entering clinical trial? Well, obviously eligibility, as we call it, is critical, meaning um, do I meet the criteria? If this is a trial for relapsing myeloma, if my myeloma is not formally relapsing by the definitions we've preset, then I may not be eligible for it. And sometimes, unfortunately, there are things that can exclude people from trials. We try as much as possible to make it real life, as it were, in the real life of a patient. But if someone may have had another illness or something very recently that could affect the, the correct um, assessment of the trial, that could influence. So talking to your physician will show you some resources at the end, including the IMF website, which is tremendous, to help us find the right trial. And very often you'll be meeting with a, a clinical research nurse or, or coordinator to talk to you about it, and then we'll talk to you about what's called informed consent. No one gets put on a trial until they know that they're on the trial. That would be unethical for me to put a patient on a trial without discussing it with them. And so slide 22 just reminds us that there is a, an informed consent. And I know, you know, when you, when you, anything you buy on your new iPhone or your apps or whatever, you just sign immediately and you agree to what's written there. That's different here, of course. It's important to go through that and understand what expected side effects are there. And so if you go to the next slide, 23, I've given you a few suggested questions or questions at least I know I receive very often. You know, how does the study work? Do I have to come in every day, every week, every month? What other tests will I need? What benefits could be there? What side effects? Uh, who do I call if I experience side effects? Can I, can I keep taking my regular vitamins and other medications? What about the financial question? All these things are really important to ask. Now, if you go to slide 24, uh, really more for reference than for me to discuss at length tonight, there are other kinds of studies, what are called longitudinal studies and, or registry studies or expanded access programs that are built on the same model that we've had, but a little bit more broadly. And sometimes a drug may be available for a period of time right before it gets approved, and so the terms of the trial may be a little bit different. Now, slide 25 could make your head spin a little bit because there's so many words on it, and I do this purposely, honestly, to encourage you that we are seeing a whole series of new drugs being tested in multiple myeloma. And I'm going to spend uh, the next few minutes talking about those before we move into some question and answer. And I've highlighted three of them here in bold because they're ones that, uh, four of them, I'm sorry, uh, they're ones that are getting a lot of press that we know may well be in the clinic before long, Isatuximab, Salinex, or Venetoclax and the, the, the very well-known CAR T-cell therapy. But as you can see, that's not it. There are lots of other drugs, and this is by no means a comprehensive list. Just today, I was planning a couple of phase one trials that I'll be involved with, and we were looking at four new drugs that we're considering. So this list could go on and on, but I've tried to give you an abbreviated list. Furthermore, if you go to slide 26, I've put them by their, their so-called categories, monoclonal antibodies, where we know a drug can hook onto the outside of a cell and trigger your immune system to destroy it. And we were learning about more hooks on the outsides of cells that we can grab onto, like CD38 and SLAMF6. We know that there are drugs that work kind of like the current drugs you may know about, lanolidomide and pomalidomide, well, that, that sort of interact in the immune system 
and they're called immune modulators, and there's a new drug called CC220 and actually a few more versions of it. I'll talk a little bit about these other new drugs, venetoclax and selenexor. And then, of course, everyone's very excited about immunotherapy and CAR T-cell therapy and all the different types, and we'll get into that a little bit towards the end. So slide 27 introduces us to a drug called venetoclax. Now, these drugs are not yet approved by the FDA for myeloma. Venetoclax, interestingly, is approved for, for different blood cancers. And, and this may be one of the first so-called targeted therapies in myeloma, which is to say somewhere around 15% of myeloma patients have a genetic abnormality of the cancer cells, not their own inherent genetics, as we discussed earlier, but genes of the cancer cells. And these letters can be confusing for people. You don't need to know too, too much about it. But just know that T1114 means there's a so-called translocation of 11 and 14. What that means is, to keep it simple, a little piece of chromosome 11 and a little piece of chromosome 14 that are not supposed to be connected get connected. And when they do, it affects the cell. And it expresses something called BCL2. That gets what we call overexpressed. So it, it allows the cell to live longer, right? Cells are kind of like us. You know, cancer cells want to live forever. The problem is is sometimes they can grow out of control. And so this allows a cell to grow out of control. Well, this is a drug that targets that area, that knows how to turn off that overexpression, if you will, of BCL2. And if you go to the next slide, I'll just show you, again, there's a lot of numbers here, but if you look at those three columns in the middle, you'll see that those patients that had the translocation 1114 had a what we call ORR, or overall response rate of 40%, whereas those who didn't have it, to the right of it, only had a 6% response rate. Now, you might say 40% is not that great, but in a group of patients that were very sick who had failed everything else, 40% is actually quite a dramatic response rate. And so we saw within that that this drug can really help patients that have that translocation 1114. And the next slide shows to us that we can get really extraordinary response rates when we add it to bortezomib. So it seems that there's something special about combining venetoclax and bortezomib that even in patients who have had bortezomib, what we call refractoriness, meaning that their disease has already broken through bortezomib, we may be able to rescue some of them again with this combination. The next slide, slide 30, shows to us that it's not just about the 1114. It's actually about this gene, this BCL2 gene, that is, the, that, that is a, a, a overexpressed in these patients with translocation 1114. That when people have high expression of it, they really can respond to this combination of drugs. And then lastly, on slide 31, as you may know, carfilzomib is another drug in the class of bortezomib. And we're seeing really tremendous, and you don't have to memorize these letters, but we're coming to learn that we put these two drugs together and it can lead to what we call apoptosis or the, the programmed cell death of myeloma. And it seems that, you know, sometimes, as you and I know, one drug can work well, another drug can work well, but you put the two together and the sum of the, uh, of the two is greater uh, than, uh, the, the synergy of the two is greater than the sum of the, of the two meaning that these two drugs can really work well together, and we're starting to see that. And the next slide, slide 32, shows that we saw lots of response when we've combined these two drugs together. So again, not yet approved by the FDA, not something that we're using routinely, but especially for those patients, that 15 or 20% of patients that have this variant, if you will, of myeloma, the drug is very promising. Now, if you go to slide 33, we come to a whole new drug, and this could well be one of the next drugs approved uh, by the FDA for multiple myeloma. And again, you've got all these, these funky pictures, and I try to keep this simple and say, we have these things inside the nucleus of your cell that, that are good. They're called tumor suppressors. Even the sound of it is good. It suppresses the tumor. And this drug stops those good suppressors from leaving the tumor. I joke and say, you host a party at your house, you want the cool people to stay there longer because then the party keeps going on. So, so this drug, if you will, closes the doors so that the good folks at your party don't leave and the party carries on. So this, these tumor suppressors can keep the tumor in check for longer. And this is a whole new class of drug called Selenexor. And the next slide, slide 34, 
uh, tells us that this was studied in what was called the STORM study, which I just got an update on today, actually, where it tried to see how effective is this drug when someone has basically had everything, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, bortezomib, carfilzomib, and an anti-CD38 drug like daratumumab. And slide 35 shows us that, again, in every one of those groups, there was about a 20 to 22% response rate. Now, again, that might not immediately seem like a high response rate to you, but in the myeloma world, that's quite impressive. Anything over 20% is quite impressive by itself, let alone when it gets used in combination. Slide 36 brings us to a next drug called esetuximab, and I, I threw in some pictures here for the basic science geeks in the crowd who like to see the molecule and so on. But this is a drug very much like daratumumab that you may be familiar with. Daratumumab is a drug that hooks on to something called CD38, uh, which is on the outside of almost all myeloma cells, and it triggers the immune system to help destroy it. The next slide, 37, helps us understand, though, that both daratumumab and now esetuximab actually do more than that. They even engage other parts of your immune system in what's called the immunomodulatory side of this with the, the colored photos on that side to help get other cells and other uh, features of the immune system to help destroy the multiple myeloma. And so this drug is a drug that I've had the privilege of working with from its very first day. I led the first in man study or first in human study for this drug. And it's quite likely in the next year to two years, we'll be able to bring it to the clinic. And I show you on slide 38 that there's all sorts of clinical trials going on for this drug. Uh, as you see the different phases, now that you're all experts in phase one, phase two, and phase three, uh, but also that we're using it in ND or, or newly diagnosed multiple myeloma as well as relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. So a little bit like we're seeing now with Dertumab, this drug will be used across all sorts of areas. And the probably key trial for this drug is, called, is the trial that I had the privilege of leading, uh, which was the esetuximab plus pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And that's led, if you go to slide uh, 39, that's led to um, uh, the, a big phase three trial that's now ongoing uh, using um, uh, the uh, esetuximab POMDEX versus POMDEX, uh, and that will likely be the path, as we call it, to registration, which means the way in which the drug will be approved by the FDA. Well, before I wrap up and lead us to uh, questions, no talk on myeloma clinical trials can be complete without talking a little bit about CAR T-cell therapy here on slide 40. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard about this. Some of you may well be on a CAR T-cell uh, therapy uh, or planning to be on one. And so we'll talk just a couple of minutes about it. Slide 41 helps us see a little bit uh, what happens here. And I know the photo may not have completely come through perfectly, but the idea is we take um, a sample of... Um, the, the patient's tumor and the patient's what are called T cells. Um, and we can actually, in the lab, uh, after we've taken this from the patient through what's called apheresis, some of you have been through a stem cell transplant know that uh, we can take some of your cells off on a machine that looks like a dialysis machine. And the key point here is that we can, through a manufacturing process, find a way to match um, the patient's own uh, tumor cells uh, to uh, the tumor itself, we can, where it can very precisely in that patient hook on to uh, the patient's own tumor and destroy it. And one of the unique features of CAR T cells, or what are called chimeric antigen receptor T cells, is that we can multiply these T cells in the lab. So it, it's kind of like you know, you've got a very individualized soldier cell in your body that's help protecting you. We take that soldier and we multiply the soldier and then we specifically train the soldier to attack your tumor and give it back to you so that we can actually see uh, the tumor destroyed. And if you go to slide 42, there's all sorts of different trials that have been done that with each sequential study, we're seeing a higher and higher response rate more patients being treated, 
and actually the drug process or this this treatment process becoming safer. There were some real safety and understandably safety concerns at the start, but that's getting better. The mo- the one that's that's most recently given the greatest interest in slide 43 is what's called the BB2121 trial. Uh, this was a trial in patients who are really quite sick with multiple myeloma. And I know you may not be familiar with seeing these curves in slide 44, but one of the things to notice is the very first line that says PFS or progression-free survival of 11.8 months in patients who are treated at the right dose. You have to understand this is a group of patients who tragically have basically failed all treatment. And if they had not been treated, many of them sadly would have died within one to two months, maybe three months max. So for them to stay in remission for a whole year was really quite remarkable. And this was a turning point, I think, for us in the CAR T-cell world, because there were some early concerns that maybe CAR T's would only last for a few weeks or a couple of months. But when we saw this out to 12 months, we started to realize that if it can do that much in the sickest of patients, maybe earlier on it can do even more. Uh, For time's sake, I won't uh, talk about slide 45 because there's lots of detail there. But the the point, key point here is that we're seeing tremendous response rates for a longer period of time. There are still some safety concerns, and of course, the biggest concern right now is access to these drugs and to these processes. But with time, we hope that to be better. Lastly, on slide 46, if these CAR T cells hook onto the tumor, we've learned that the best place to hook onto the tumor is through this target, as we call it, called BCMA, or a B cell maturation antigen. And it's really heavily expressed, a bit like CD38 in all myeloma cells, but interestingly, is very much expressed or is present even after someone's had a lot of treatment. So even after lots of treatment, this is still a way to grab onto the tumor. And for patients who can't go through the complexity of CAR T cell therapy, there are drugs like this one and many others are being made. This is just one that's called GSK7916 because it's made by the company GlaxoSmithKline that actually just goes directly and hooks onto that. So instead of all the manufacturing and T cells and soldiers, it's just a drug that people take that hooks on to BCMA to destroy the cell. So you're going to hear a lot about BCMA clinical trials before long. Slide 47 reminds us that probably the best, uh, the most comprehensive list of clinical trials, of course, is at clinicaltrials.gov. And I just did a search two days ago before before this talk, and there are over 2,400 clinical trials for myeloma, of which almost 450 are currently accruing. So there are lots of options, no matter where you live geographically. Obviously, some places are more challenging than others, but there are a lot of options there. Furthermore, uh, as Robin had mentioned from the start on slide 48, if you go to our IMF website at myeloma.org, we have lots of information about clinical trials and fact sheets. And before I close, let me just tell you that one of the things that excites me the most about the great work at the IMF is that we are now doing our own clinical trials, Um, three in particular that I'm going to quickly mention. Uh, The first is the... uh, Caesar trial on slide 49, which is to, to try to see can we catch myeloma early enough and potentially even think about curing it, where we take patients who have what are, what's called HRSMM or high-risk smoldering myeloma and treat them with a, a pretty aggressive therapy of carfilzomib and lenalidomide, dexamethasone, uh, a transplant, and more of those drugs. And, and we saw at ASH last year, this was a really impressive way of We're trying to explore this notion, can we catch the disease early enough and even cure it? The next slide, slide 50, is the American equivalent of that called the ASCENT trial, led by my former colleague at Mayo, Shaji Kumar, and Dr. Dury is going to be blogging about this trial this week. For those of you that follow his blog, similar concept. We become give fairly aggressive therapy to patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma can we potentially catch this disease earlier? And then lastly, slide 51 is the Iceland MM trial, which we've been going on for two years. Some of you may know we're screening the whole adult population of Iceland. So 85,000 people have consented. We've collected over 45,000 samples. 
and we're diagnosing patients every week with MGUS and smoldering and active myeloma. And we're going to learn a lot about the disease, and maybe because so many patients in Iceland have had their own genes tested, maybe we can learn why myeloma happens, the, the genetic basis of it. And, and we took the same concept. Many of you know the PROMISE study has just started. It was a stand-up to cancer grant that Irene Gobriel and Ivan Borello and myself and others obtained where we're going to take this concept of screening large populations of patients but now choose two groups, patients who are first-degree relatives of myeloma patients and, secondly, African-Americans because we know that, unfortunately, African-American individuals are twice as high a risk for multiple myeloma. So my last slide, which now I pretty well put on all of my slide decks when I give a talk now, is this beautiful study that I won't give you a lot of detail on, but just briefly mention that this is a study that compared giving people an opportunity to communicate more effectively with their healthcare team in cancer, as opposed to the usual, which is maybe calling and leaving a message and getting them to call you back. It was designed to show that we could give better, we could have better quality of life as, my, as patients with cancer if we had better communication with our team. But the surprising, beautiful feature of the study is it actually showed that patients can live longer. And so I like to say you can have the fanciest and most complicated clinical trial with all the new drugs in the world, but what continues to affect the survival of our patients is good communication. I really hope that that's a feature of you and your healthcare team. So I'd like to thank everybody here on slide 53 for listening to me for so long. I apologize, I went about two minutes longer than I wanted to. I wanted to stop at quarter two, uh, but it's our privilege to be with you tonight, and I also want to thank our sponsors, as Robin did at the start. And, Robin, I shall turn it to you uh, to uh, continue, and we'll take some questions. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Dr. McHale. And I found it really especially interesting that Dr. Dury wrote in his blog in today's Myeloma Minute about that launch of the ASCENT trial in the U.S. So that's a really interesting thing for people to follow up on. So now it is time to open up our lines for questions. If you have a question that you would like to ask, again, please press star one on your phone. And we ask you to please remember to keep your questions general in nature and specific to myeloma to benefit all listeners on this teleconference. So John, could you please start us off with our first question? First question comes from the line of Jack Aiello. Your line is now open. Dr. McHale, it's always great listening to your presentations. It seems like the next drug that will get approved for myeloma is Selenexor. And yet when I've talked with various doctors about it, they're concerned with side effects. So can you give patients an idea of the side effect profile of Selenexor? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Jack, it's always good to hear your voice, my friend. I appreciate what you do and advocate for the myeloma community. Uh, people like you are, are the ones that uh, I really uh, believe make such an impact. So thank you for what you do. Um, yes, yeah, Selenexor is a drug that I, I actually have a fair amount of experience with. Uh, when I was at Mayo, we, we treated a number of patients with it. And, um, you know, one of the things we do at the IMF is work with the manufacturers of these companies to help explain these drugs to patients, and I'm actually meeting with that whole team next week, so your timing is very good in the question. It, it is a drug that, um, as I mentioned, I think is going to be very important in the myeloma community because it works when everything else has failed and may work even better when it's used in combination, but it does have some side effects. I think we've learned a lot about giving the drug a little bit differently. In the early days, it was really tough on patients. It caused uh, not just nausea, but, but a form of anorexia where people just didn't want to eat anything. And people often got dehydrated, and then that made it even worse because then they were sicker. But we have learned that if we hydrate patients well, if we keep close tabs with them, some people benefit from an appetite stimulant uh, like Megase. Some people uh, benefit from different medications that we can use. Every patient is unique. Uh, but we found when we get really aggressive with trying to control that anorexia in the first month, something happens after a month of it that patients can tolerate the drug a lot better and stay on it. So it is something that is very important that as this drug indeed becomes available, we're going to have to work very hard and remind people, you know, the, as I say, the worst month is the first month. Let's get you through it. 
I bring in patients every week and give them a bit of fluid and make sure that they're doing okay and have a chat with them uh, with our, one of our nurses. And we found that if we can get people through that first bit, then it becomes really convenient because it's just a pill. They don't have to come in as frequently and, and the drug can be effective. Thanks very much. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Chasey Erdu. Your line's now open. Um, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, uh, my question is about the CAR T cell trials. My wife uh, was uh, going to get into one of those programs, but she was disqualified because a couple of years ago, she had uh, developed a case where there was a blood clot in the back of her neck, not in the brain, but in the back of her neck. And that uh, that was one of the reasons they said uh, that she would be disqualified. I was wondering, is this kind of a temporary thing or will that be changing later on where she might be qualified later on? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, that that happened and that um, that she wasn't able to go on to the study. I hope with time uh, that obviously she'll do extremely well. Um, yes, you know, you actually raise in general a very important point that uh, perhaps I didn't emphasize and should have in the talk, so thank you for asking that question, which is when we do clinical trials, very often we do have to, if you will, exclude patients with certain things. And that's not meant to try and be elitist or exclude people, but if you really want to make sure that a signal is being had or that a drug is working, you don't want any background noise, right? If you want to taste something and see if you like it or not, you don't necessarily douse it with all sorts of sauce on top before you taste it because you want to see what it really tastes like because those other things can interfere. So very often, we want to make sure that if someone is having a side effect, for example, that it's from the drug we're giving them, not because they already have neuropathy. Or we want to make sure that if a blood clot is there, it's not because they already have a tendency to blood clots. So very early on in studies, especially in the earlier phases of studies that I described earlier, the phase ones and the phase twos, we tend to be more restrictive. With time, those restrictions do become less and less. And then ultimately, once a therapy is approved, um, usually there are very few restrictions. There still may be the FDA may mandate that certain things shouldn't be done or, or, or certain things have to be checked in advance. But more often than not, for things like blood clots or if someone had previously a heart condition or a different kind of cancer or uh, diabetes or something that in the short term might disqualify them from a narrow study, when um, it's more available to patients, it can be more accessible. And I do understand that this is a, sort of, a source of frustration for patients who say, look, I met every criteria for the trial except for this one thing. Uh, and sometimes we can make exceptions, but sometimes it just can't be um, in the short trial. But the hope is with time that almost all those restrictions are lifted. Thanks for your Thank question. You. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Fred Swingle. Your line's now open. Hello, and thank you for the good talk. Uh, I am kind of along the same line as the last uh, question. I'm a non-secretor, which seems to disqualify me from uh, trials. Is there any way around that? Yeah, thank you for your question. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that it has been uh, a disqualifying feature to you. Uh, you know, very similar to what we've just said, the, re the real challenge with non-secretory or secretory myeloma, as I'll explain to everyone, is is that it's it's sometimes hard to know uh, where the level of the disease is. So about 99% of myeloma patients, 98 to 99%, have something that we can measure fairly easily, either through a, almost always a blood test, potentially through a, a urine test that gives us a measure of the disease. So for most of you on the line, you're familiar with following your M spike or your IgG level or your light chain level. Um, unfortunately, there is a variant of myeloma where the cells are there and they're growing and they're causing damage and they're sending signals to the body but they don't have that easily measurable bad protein in the blood or the urine. And we sometimes call those patients non-secretory, meaning it's not secreting any kind of tumor marker in the blood. Uh, 
Now, thankfully, with more sophisticated light chain testing and soon with the introduction of what we call mass spectrometry testing, that percentage is getting smaller and smaller. Furthermore, with better imaging, as sometimes we can follow patients with, with a certain kind of PET scan or some kind of CT scan, that reduces it. But unfortunately, sir, there still are patients who are in that non-secretory category. And the reason why they get excluded from trials is that if there isn't an easy measure of the disease, it's harder to measure how effective a drug is. It's like saying I want to go on a weight loss program, but I can never measure my weight. So I can't really tell, did I gain weight? Did I lose weight? You know, what really, what, what was measurable in the, in the difference? Now, some patients, very occasionally, some trials will allow repeated bone marrow measures, which is not always fun to do. Uh, but unfortunately, for most non-secretory patients, it means that if there's no way of measuring the disease, then they'll have to wait until a trial is nearly done uh, to be able to access the drug. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Ray Tidler III. Your line is now open. Thank you, Doctor, for your excellent presentation. My question is this. If I need to undergo CAR T cell therapy, can my leftover or existing stem cells taken back in 2011 be used? Or would I need to have new cells taken uh, by apheresis? I ask this because I am concerned that given all of the lines of therapy that I have received by now, my cells might be damaged. That's my question. That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. You know, we're learning a lot more now through CAR T-cell apheresis, as you described, or that process of, of skimming cells off of someone's blood, you know, what can be used and what can't be used, and we're starting to explore even, can we collect these T cells from patients and freeze them, kind of like we do now with stem cells. You collect someone's stem cells, and, and we can freeze them and potentially use them later. Is that something we're going to be doing down the line with myeloma patients, just as you've indicated, sir, when maybe their T cells aren't as beaten down and you know, when the soldiers are young and fresh, as it were, and strong. That being said, right now, specifically in your situation, it would be very difficult to do that because when those stem cells would have been collected, there's a different, if you will, group of cells being collected, the true stem cells that can give rise to others. And the technology is not quite there yet for us to, if you will, mature those stem cells and grow T cells out of them. Now, it's not very Star Trekian to think that someday we may be able to do that. Um, but right now, in general, we're, we're unable to do that. Um, and we can't do that kind of manipulation where we would have to recollect from you those explicit uh, T cells um, to be able to capture them for a CAR T cell therapy. As I say, in the future, uh, hopefully we can, we can, I don't want to use the word play as if this is a game, but we can play with these techniques or, or modify these techniques to do that. But right now, because there may be many people on the phone who have had stem cells stored at some point, right now the technology is, is not such that we can just take those out of the freezer and concoct T cells from them, unfortunately. Okay. But thanks for your question. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Fern Solero. Your line is now open. Good evening, doctor. Thank you so much. Um, my question is about venetoclax. And in a uh, person that was diagnosed about four months ago has had one initial line of therapy and has the translocation. How do you get, I mean, we've spoken to our doctor about it, but not really been offered as a line of therapy? Is it not for beginning treatment, or is it more for relapse patients? Uh, well, you, you guys have the greatest questions tonight. <laughs> That's an excellent <laughs> question, um, and something that is that is being evaluated. I mean, the short answer to your question is, 
you know, right now, Veneta Clax is not approved by the FDA, so okay. um, it, it, it's not something that your doctor can just prescribe for a myeloma patient. So, okay. so, so, so that's one of the reasons why. Now, there are some times that we can access it even off of clinical trial because these trial results have been impressive. There is this notion that because the drug is already FDA approved for a different indication, there can be what is sometimes called a compassionate use release or different kinds of release where the company can actually provide the drug when uh, a patient has been shown to have transication 1114. Okay. Now, that is usually in a situation where the patient has either um, not necessarily exhausted all, but has, has gone through most lines of therapy because that's where more of the clinical trials were done. Now, I see that as a moving target. You know, in general, and again, this I think is a good point for all of us on the call to appreciate, that in general, we see drugs, if you will, cut their teeth or prove themselves in the very heavily relapsed myeloma population where people have had multiple lines of, tri of, of treatment before and then slowly works its way back into earlier and earlier and then eventually into frontline therapy. Mm -hmm. I suspect that with venetoclax, it'll have a similar kind of approach where, you know, you don't have to wait multiple lines. If someone has a transcation 1114, maybe it can be very effective earlier on. And there are some studies, some of the patients included in some of the studies I showed today, did have patients not quite newly diagnosed, but earlier on in their relapse. So it's not something that's quite available yet if someone was just diagnosed four months ago, uh, okay. but in six or 12 months from now, that could be a different story. So what would you discuss with your physician? I mean, I guess that... I think I would discuss, you know, again, it's, it's hard for me to get into any individual case, and I'm always right, careful on a, on a public phone to, you know, public line to discuss that because I, I obviously can't give advice not, not right. knowing the whole circumstance. But in general... What, what we do with a lot of our, and what I would do with my transication 1114 patients early on, is mm -hmm. we start with the, the standards of care, which is, you know, typically right. bortezomib and lenalidomide and dexamethasone or something like that, and have that, if you will, in the back of our mind saying, let's see how people do. Very often, in general, we've considered transication 1114 to be lower risk myeloma, meaning mm -hmm. patients tend to respond to the other things. So we start with what we know is tried and true. And then if, unfortunately, with time, the disease breaks through multiple lines of therapy, that's when we tend to go. But knowing that someone is uh, 1114, I think, is a good thing to know, to keep in mind with each of those lines of therapy. So thanks for your question. Well, thank you for your answer. I appreciate it very much. All right. I'll Jackson, check in with Robin. Do we have time for any more questions, or are we on the end here? Yeah, that's what, it's, it's that time that we have to kind of wrap it up. But there is good news, Dr. McHale, because we can let people know that if they didn't have the opportunity to ask you a question tonight, the IMF has the info line available, and they do have lots of great answers. So people can call 1-800-452-CURE, which is 2873, and Missy, Judy, and Paul are happy to take these calls and help you. They're available Monday through Friday from 9 to 4 Pacific. So I just want to give a couple of quick reminders and then also to please ask people to stay on the call for one more minute because we'd love to get your input from an important survey. So a couple of reminders that I feel are important for all of you to know about is uh, ASH is coming up. Now, that's the American Society of Hematology annual meetings. They're taking place in San Diego, December 1st through the 4th. And the IMF will be there with lots of different programs like the ASH Satellite Symposium on Friday, November 30th. And that's going to cover new strategies for myeloma care, next steps for the future. We also have the International Myeloma Working Group Conference Series, which will happen on Monday, December 3rd. We'll have lots of interviews available on the IMF website with top myeloma experts providing their input from key oral and poster presentations. And we even have peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning with our support group leaders blogging and tweeting directly from ASH. So that's all really exciting and coming up. And I just wanted to remind everyone of that. 
And again, of course, thank you, Dr. McHale, and especially all of you on tonight's call. I hope this has helped you. And again, thanks to our sponsors for making this educational program possible, Celgene, Sanofi, Genzyme, and Takeda. And now it's time to conclude the call with a quick but very important survey. So John, would you please begin the four short survey questions? 